Yesterday, news hit that the chisel chin himself, Henry Cavill, will not be reprising his role as DC Superman as part of the Warner Brothers cinematic direction. For some, this is far from shocking information as word has been out that Warner Brothers have been mulling over a completely new direction with its Superman canon for quite some time, considering a radical new image for the somewhat hit and miss on screen interpretations of the DC universe. For the most part, Warner Brothers have been focusing on a complete and utter overhaul of their DC image, following the wake of Justice League's massive underperformance at the box office. It was intended to be the DC Cinematic Universe contender to Infinity War and the flagship of the franchise, but fell completely short of its $1 billion global goal with just $657.9 million. Following a statement from the studio which went on to explain that Cavill's departure had been in the wind for quite some time, the star won't be reprising his role as Superman, with the studio instead focusing on other Justice League bombshells such as Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman 1984 and Jason Momoa's Aquaman. A spokesperson from the studio said, We have a great relationship and great respect for Henry Cavill that continues to remain unchanged. Additionally, we have made no current decisions regarding any upcoming Superman films. So where does that leave our ex Man of Steel? Well, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that Cavill has pinched the lead as Geralt of Rivia in the upcoming Netflix adaptation of The Witcher series. Admittedly, it's pretty clear where the conflict of interest has occurred here, with the main man trading in the cape for the Zwiehander permanently. The lead role in a television series is a huge investment of time, and Cavill is likely set to reinvent himself as an actor as the dark, broody, gallows humorous witcher, rather than the clean cut Man of Steel. So that leaves us with a completely different set of boots to fill. Deadline, along with several other news sources, have reportedly staked their claim as Michael B. Jordan having an almost guaranteed role as the new Superman somewhere down the road. But where will that leave the franchise as a whole? For one, MBJ will be the first black actor to reprise the role of Superman and perhaps add a much needed dimension to the relatively straightforward franchise. Let's not beat around the bush. Superman is pretty boring. It's hard to add character depth when you're overpowered as balls, but there are a few exciting options for Michael B. Jordan's Superman. For one, we've got Val Zod, the second Kryptonian to ever head up the mantle of Superman. First appearing in Earth 2 issue 19, Val escaped a tyrannical Krypton government, fleeing the planet during its destruction in his parents' capsule. There he taught himself from his parents' records left over in the capsule, understanding that violence was the stupidest way to overcome dilemma. In in the process becoming a pacifist. Already we've got a fresh new storyline for Superman that leaves room to breathe for the leftover Clark Kent role. Val has a pretty awesome storyline throughout Earth 2, particularly World's End, and is a fresh reboot for contemporary DC fans. Perhaps it will aim to please the die-hard fandom rather than pandering towards a relatively despondent audience. Warner Brothers really need to shake up a thing or two. Even more likely though is the Calvin Ellis version of Superman, literally the President of the United States, originally based on Barack Obama during his time in office, and later added in Final Crisis issue 7. Calvin Ellis's origin mirrors Clark Kent's nearly identically, and could be a much more streamlined way for Michael B. Jordan to step into the role. Admittedly, a lot of retconning would be needed to divulge the multiverse, but yeah, it could be done. Michael B. Jordan is a fantastic actor, and personally, DC would be foolish not to snap him up. But as we know, MBJ is already penned into the Marvel role of Eric Killmonger, and was a huge fan favourite for the Black Panther reveal. Yes, granted Killmonger dies at the end of the MCU film, but if you're a fan of the comic book run, you'll know that Killmonger gets resurrected on several occasions, initially by the Mandarin. Lead director Kevin Feige has already stated that a Black Panther sequel is in the pipeline for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and Michael B. Jordan clearly stated in an interview for MTV that he'd jump at the chance to return as Eric Killmonger. So would we be getting into a cinematic tug of war between DC and Marvel Studios? Well, only time will tell. Number 10, Headpool, the Merc with half a mouth. This version of Deadpool hails from Earth 2149, in which everyone has been turned into zombies. Even though not much is known about this version of Wade, you can assume it's probably similar to the original, hence why he's only number 10 on the list. While he still had a body after he got infected, he attacked the Silver Surfer. He was later brought to Earth 616 and calls himself the Merc with half a mouth, since most of his jaw is missing. Even though he had been killed when Wondar the Aquarian threw Wade at Jennifer Kale, Kale retaliated by luring Deadpool into 
to blades that tore him to shreds. Deadpool was taken away by armor and was now only a head. After that he essentially affects all menfish and it spreads from there. The only reason I have him on this list is because this story is so Deadpool. Like you're literally just a head but you managed to escape from armor and then escape from Black Talon? It must have taken a lot of planning. Will you use your head Wade? Number 9 Soldier Supreme Gamora, man. Why did you think it was a good idea to merge half of the world's souls with the other? I mean, the result was pretty cool, but come on. Anyway, Gamora got a hold of the Infinity Gala and all hell broke loose. She merged half of the population with the other, this creating the Soldier Supreme, a mix of Captain America and me. The super soldier serum that Cap originally took was now just a cover-up for a mystical arts ritual. And after being stuck in the dark dimension for decades, he got released by accident when Mordok opened a portal to try to summon Satan. Really? Like I'm right here. Rogers projected his astral form into Mordok and realized that he was the combination of two souls, Modok and Baron Mordo. Modok told him to use his eye of Agamodin, yeah, to find the truth for himself before fading away. When the Soldier Supreme got to London, he was debriefed on what he missed. He then used the eye to realize he was made of the souls of Steve Rogers and Doctor Strange, which for some reason you all think is me. I'm Connor, guys. Then he objected to Adam Warlock's ideas of reversing things, but ended up letting the world continue in the Soul Gem. Hey, I think he should be brought back. Also, of course it's Doctor Strange who figures out that the whole world is a lie and that's not the way it should be, right? Like, come on. Like, this, this guy is a doctor, right? Number 8, Aldous Hodge. With the pretty upsetting downfall of DC's Black Adam movie, Aldous Hodge is not likely to return as Hawkman, although I have to say he was awesome in that role. So instead, maybe Marvel should jump on it and snag this absolutely terrific actor to jump into the role of Kang the Conqueror, assuming Majors gets recast. Even if it wasn't for Kang, I think Marvel should snag all this while they can. The guy is an awesome, intense actor. He's physically imposing and he is no stranger to comic books either, having also voiced Jon Stewart, Green Lantern, in the animated movie Green Lantern Beware My Power. Also, this guy has been hustling in the acting world for a good long while, doing a lot of smaller roles. To see him step into the role of Kang would be super cathartic. I feel like he deserves it, especially after Black Adam was a bit of a critical failure. Number 7, John David Washington. When looking at a replacement for Jonathan Majors, we can readily look at actors that are in or around the same level of their careers. Personally, I think John David Washington is one actor that has made a name for himself in recent years. Establishing himself with films like Black Klansman, Tenet, Malcolm and Marie, and Amsterdam, not to mention his role in Ballers, Washington has shown that he is more than diverse and talented enough as an actor to take on the time-traveling, multiversal villain of Kang the Conqueror. His role in Tenet in particular shows off Washington's action skills, able to perform extremely complex stunts and fight scenes. Coupled with his ability to convey intensity and ruthlessness, transfer that over to Kang, and coupled with a little dash of his likability, I could see him slotting very nicely into the MCU without too much fuss. The other thing about John David Washington is that he's got some name recognition thanks to his pops. Number 6, Denzel Washington. If we are going to talk about the son, it would be extremely interesting to see his dad jump into the role as well, most likely as a much much older variant of Nathaniel Richards, and I think we all know that Denzel could pull it off with an imposing and intense performance. Throughout his whole career, we have seen Denzel bring a similar mood to his characters that Majors brought to King, and he still brings that kind of performance to his more recent roles too. Just look at Denzel in Training Day, The Equalizer, American Gangster, or Malcolm X, and then imagine what he can do as the MCU's Conqueror. On the one hand, I think it would be almost impossible to convince Denzel to do it, actually, and I also think it might take you out of the world of the MCU, but if it was handled similarly to how Josh Brolin was with Thanos, like they treated him with the same kind of gravity, it would be pretty cool and it would actually be incredibly compelling. Number 5, John Boyega. Another name that has floated around more than almost any other in terms of who could jump into a Jonathan Major sized hole would be John Boyega. A Boyega has been a bit quieter recently. His character in Star Wars was done kind of dirty. And that's not just my opinion. A lot of people wish that Finn got the respect he deserved. So, maybe a way for Disney to pay this guy back for that is to just give him the chance to destroy the Avengers. I think it would be absolutely dope. Watch any of Boyega's other films like Attack the Block, Detroit, Pacific Rim, Uprising, and even the Star Wars films, and you'll see there's no shortage of talent when it comes to Boyega. He absolutely kills it almost every single time. Not only is he talented, but he can handle the pressures of a blockbuster too. But Boyega is also young enough to do a string of films from Marvel if they wanted him, and the physicality to accomplish the required action scenes. Boyega has my vote for sure. That's all I'm saying. 
Number 4, Giancarlo Esposito. This guy seems to have the secret key to inserting himself into different franchises as an intense big bad. Now similar to if Denzel Washington were to play an older variant of Kang, I think the same would have to happen for Esposito. I couldn't see him coming in to play the main big bad, not really. Also we know that Esposito is trying to get himself into more good guy type roles, but given his proclivity for playing villains in seemingly everything, it wouldn't surprise me to see him jump from Star Wars to the MCU. Quick tangent here though, I really, really, really like Giancarlo Esposito, but I don't think he has ever really hit quite the same as a villain as when he first knocked it out of the park in Breaking Bad. That's just my opinion. He was so good in that role, but not a lot of his subsequent roles have given him that same level of writing, so I feel like he still has a lot more to give. Maybe in the MCU. Number 3, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. Yahya has been having a good career so far, especially recently starring in the Aquaman movies, Matrix Resurrections, Candyman, The Watchmen series, and he's even slated to be in the Mad Max spin-off Furiosa movie in 2024. He's an incredibly strong actor, and it almost feels like he has come out of nowhere. The only issue I can think of is that he may have some conflicting issues for being in the Aquaman movies, but if those movies aren't going to be continuing forward into DC's new James Gunn led movie universe, I think it would be silly for Marvel to not at least take Mateen onto their movies in some capacity. He has already proved himself as a comic book villain as Black Manta in Aquaman, but Kang would give this talented actor the opportunity to show off many more approaches to playing a villain. Number 2, Javier Bardem. I read a little part of an article that mentioned Javier Bardem as a possible choice to step into the role of Kang, and honestly, I don't hate it. In fact, I kinda love it. Javier Bardem hasn't failed to capture attention in any of his roles. He's incredibly versatile as an actor. He is more than capable enough to play an imposing villain, just look at him in Skyfall or No Country for Old Men. He's also incredibly likable at the same time. Again, just watch Skyfall. But even his recent role in Dune, or in, oh, I don't know, anything this actor has been in, and I think you'd be hard pressed to try and convince anyone that a Javier Bardem take on Kang the Conqueror wouldn't totally rock, with his awesome and unique approach and imposing voice. Also, he was easily one of my favorite parts of the recent Dune movie, and he didn't even have that big of a role. I feel like he is just a scene stealer, and I think the most successful MCU villains have all had that quality. And finally, in at number one, Lakeith Stanfield. Now I saw some people suggest this online, and at first, I didn't really see it, but the more I thought about it, and thought about how talented and multifaceted this actor actually is, yeah, I could actually kinda see it. Lakeith Stanfield has tons of experience delivering multifaceted characters, all of whom are unique and have a natural intensity and unpredictability. All factors that can make him a perfect fit for Kang. I think Lakeith is maybe a little less physically imposing as some of the other actors on this list, but we have also seen actors make massive physical changes to take on Marvel comic book character roles. With his range of acting skills, he could bring a fresh and thrilling take on the character, making Nathaniel Richards a menacing antagonist that the MCU has yet to see. Stanfield's ability to transform himself into different characters while maintaining an underlying sense of authenticity could just elevate Kang to a whole new level. Number 10, Scott Lang as Ant-Man. Despite technically being the second hero to wear the Ant-Man costume, Scott Lang is perhaps the most beloved. Although, some of that might stem from the original Ant-Man Hank Pym being kind of awful. There's something about slapping your wife that just doesn't scream endearing. Doesn't help the third Ant-Man is kind of a pervert too. Yeesh, what's with this character? Thankfully, Scott Lang is a lot more likable. And justifiably so. He was even the Ant-Man chosen to appear in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which says enough about him. Especially since you can cast Paul Rudd in anything and he will be instantly lovable. So they have that in common. And given every criminal act he does is for the sake of his daughter, it's hard not to relate to Scott. So for all that and more, Scott Lang is my Ant-Man of choice. Number 9, Dream of the Endless, Sandman. Admittedly, this version of the Sandman is not a conventional superhero, but Neil Gaiman's run of the character is well regarded as one of the most essential comics that everybody must read. The Sandman is a dark fantasy story centering around the Sandman, who also goes by the names Morpheus, Oneros, and many, many others. After being taken prisoner for 70 years, he escapes and exacts vengeance upon his captors. Combining aspects of horror and fantasy, we see Morpheus travel between his kingdom, the Dreaming, and the Waking World, the world humankind inhabits. And while the comic does take place in the DC universe, very few appearances are made by other DC characters. Instead, characters from Shakespeare's work, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and characters from the Bible appear prominently as part of this universe. Incidentally, the series Lucifer, whose titular character recently had a brief crossover during CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths event, actually originated from this series. 
So given he inspired many derivative works and the series high regard, I'm going to go ahead and say that Neil Gaiman's reimagining of the Sandman is definitely the best replacement. Number 8. Finn Wolfhard. Now, if we're looking for someone who could be like an alternate Ezra Miller, like one who isn't off the rocker, then I think we shouldn't look too much farther than Canadian Stranger Things actor Finn Wolfhard. He has been hitting it off with titles like Stranger Things, It, and Ghostbusters. He's proven he can handle the pressures of a big budget, and he's definitely got that nerdy thing down pat. I think a downside to Finn here is that he hasn't really been an action star yet, and he might even be a bit too nerdy to pull that off. But he is a great actor, and and has the casting ability and fan base. A point I see another website making is that given the time traveling nature of the character, you could even make a canonical spin for why Ezra Miller has become a bit younger. The whole complete change of appearance thing might be a bit harder to explain, but whatever. All this could also be said for Timothy Chalamet as well, but I'm not too sure. What do you think? Number 7. Jack Loudon The Scottish actor who had major roles in Dunkirk and Fighting With My Family is possibly quickly becoming a sought after Hollywood actor. He has delivered a lot of impressive performances and after receiving awesome reviews for his work in Benediction, he's really going places. He even starred alongside Gary Oldman in Slow Horses so we know he can handle playing alongside some star power. On top of his recent successes though, Loudon looks a heck of a lot more like the Barry Allen from the comic books than Miller does. And has more of the everyman likable feel to him that has made this character such a favorite on the pages of comic books for decades. It's an interesting choice for sure, and I mean, I'd get behind it. Number six, Ty Sheridan. You may not really remember Ty Sheridan as Cyclops in Fox's X Men movies, proving he has what it takes to be a blockbuster superhero. But you will absolutely remember him as the star in Ready Player One, which very much proved that he has what it takes to be a leading man. For someone who is only 25, Sheridan already has a lot of great acting credits to his name, not all of which are typical blockbuster fare, similar to Ezra Miller before he became Flash. He's an exciting talent and someone I think definitely has the potential to do the Scarlet Speeder justice on screen. Some might argue he is a little too handsome for the Central City nerd, but that's never stopped big studios before, so. Uh. Number 5, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Okay, this is Kind of a joke, but also maybe not. I do think it would be absolutely hilarious if the guy who played Quicksilver in the MCU moved over and played the Scarlet Speedster in the DCEU. But when I think about when he played Kickass as well, he was very good at the whole like nerd hero thing. And the more I think and talk about this, the more I'm convincing myself it could actually work. Aaron Taylor Johnson has proven that he can play a super fast hero and one with a great sense of humor. And he's proven he's got the chops to stand in an ensemble cast. With him being criminally underutilized in the MCU, I think he deserves to jump back in and have another swing at it. Maybe wearing a bit of red instead of blue. Number 4. Tyler James Williams Okay, wild card. I saw this online and thought, hmm, it might be some food for thought. What if instead, they write Barry Allen out and write Wally West in. Now there are actually two different versions of Wally West in the comics and Keenan Lonsdale played Wally West in the Flash TV series and gave TV fans a different version of the character. Now Lonsdale has decided he's done working as a superhero, but there are some other actors that could very easily slip into that role. One of which being Tyler James Williams. The actor was introduced to audiences as a young kid in the Chris Rock comedy Everybody Hates Chris and that could help the movies persuade the audiences that he's a bit younger than he really is, 29 now, and even show he's got a bit more of that kind of nerdyish style. As a veteran of the Walking Dead series, he's got some action chops too. The only thing is that he's almost exclusively a TV actor who hasn't been central to a blockbuster movie yet. Now, I don't know. Like I said, just some food for thought. Number 3. Dylan O'Brien Reporters have already been circulating that Dylan O'Brien, the Maze Runner star, is on the Warner Bros shortlist of actors to replace Ezra Miller as The Flash. He first came on the scene in 2010 as Clever Trevor in the high school drama Sweetly High. The following year, Dylan was cast as Styles in the MTV series Teen Wolf and he killed it. That led him straight to his role as Thomas in the Maze Runner trilogy, his biggest role so far and one he handled fantastically. Dylan is another example of a young actor who can flow seamlessly between moments of grave intensity to silliness and even to comedy and nerdiness. Kind of like Ezra Miller's Flash. Number 2. Adam Andrews. Look, I got a jawline. I can be funny. I'm on a nerdy channel that literally talks about these characters and also, I just wanna. Oh and also, also, I could use the money. Stop laughing. Look, I'm super serious right now. I could do it. I could pull it off. Have I ever done a leading role in a major blockbuster? No. It's true. But hey, why not start with a multi-million dollar big studio movie? I don't know. Number 1. 
Grant Gustin. Grant Gustin is the only person who can say he has actually played The Flash, and for basically like 10 or so years. When Gustin was introduced as Barry Allen on the CW's Arrow, he quickly became a fan favorite, and when his own TV show The Flash aired, it was the highest rated and most poppin' show in the CW's DC lineup. Grant has been in 5 out of 6 crossovers, and he has the heart of the fans on his side, which was obvious when the outrage poured in after Ezra Miller was cast in instead in the DCEU. He has played the character better than anyone, and longer too, and he absolutely deserves to be tagged in to make his big screen debut. He's likeable, he isn't a criminal, he actually seems really nice as a person, he's got backup, he's already been doing it for so long. He may not have as much of the star power as some of the other actors in the Justice League, so Warner Bros should give him that by casting him. Period. Number 10, Tom Cavanaugh. Now, how hilarious would it be if the guy who played Reverse Flash on TV played real Flash in the movies? Sure, he's a bit older than Ezra Miller, but just like with Finn Wolfhard, the time traveling nature of the character, plus also the fact that the Flash movie is supposed to be somewhat based on Flashpoint, could make this work with some clever writing and trickery. Now, Tom hasn't really had many major blockbuster roles, so that is one point against him. There is also the fact that it might be a huge slap in the face to another Flash TV show actor. You know, the one who played Flash. But at the very least, I think it would be highly entertaining, even if it was just like an alternate version of The Flash, to see Tom Cavanaugh step into the red. Number 9, Liam Hemsworth. Now, I saw this on the internet where people suggested this Hemsworth, and after thinking about it for a while, I could maybe potentially see it. Now, I don't believe he really holds the same kind of nerdy persona, but like most of the Hemsworths, he's built like a Greek god, he's got a look, he can handle playing a big action role proven by his roles in Hunger Games and Independence Day Resurgence, which I mean, I didn't like that last one, but he still did it and was decent in it, and I, I think he could possibly do it, I don't know. It would be an interesting choice, but one that could actually work. I don't know for sure, so I'm gonna leave him here and wait for you to yell at me down in the comments below. Okay. Next up at number 8, Death Mask. Death Mask is another version of Death Deadpool from Earth 11638 and had a brain tumor which Reed Bridgers removed. When he did, however, Wade became a super genius and used his intellect to erect a criminal empire. He wears the Deadpool colors but in the style of Doctor Doom, and ironically in this universe, there is also a Death Wish who dresses up in the Deadpool suit using Doctor Doom colors. I think this would be a good thing for the Marvel Universe to run with. The only issue I can see with it is that it's quite the deviation from the normal Deadpool storyline, and fans may not be willing to accept that. Don't flame me in the comments. Number 7, Spider Gwen. This is some tragic crap, guys. Before the comic started, Gwen Stacy was bitten by a radioactive spider, yada yada yada. As Gwen, she starts dating Peter Parker and bullies Harry Osborn, who ends up liking her. Like, dude. Just because she's mean to you doesn't mean she likes you. Anyway, Peter becomes obsessed with Spider-Gwen, not knowing it's Gwen Stacy, even though it's literally in the name. Like, how many Gwens do you know, man? Anyway, wanting to be like her, Peter creates a serum that will turn him into a lizard man. He gets bullied again on prom night, which prompts him to take the formula and become the lizard. Honestly though, I relate. If someone had turned into a giant lizard at my prom, it would have been worth the 80 buck ticket. My prom was bad. Gwen not knowing it's Peter fights him and accidentally kills him. When he reverts back to his human form, he says I just wanted to be special like you and dies in her arms. Now everyone thinks Spider Gwen killed Peter Parker and everyone hates her. The reason I put her on this list is because recently I saw a Spider Gwen trailer on YouTube and I thought it was really real. It was supposedly starring Sabrina Carpenter and I was convinced. Then it was pointed out to me that it was fan made and I got thoroughly disappointed. Let's see a Spider Gwen live action movie please. Number 6, Spider-Man 2099. Now, I may be partial to this version since Miguel O'Hare is my favorite alternate Spider-Man, but I would have loved to see Miguel as a part of the main canon. Aside from stopping Stan Lee from having another character with two of the same initials, especially because those initials are PP. But Miguel's suit is also so much cooler than Peter's, no offense. Miguel O'Hara was awarded enrollment into the Alchemax School for Gifted Youngsters, which is a renovated version of the X-Men headquarters. Eventually in his life, Miguel becomes the head of the genetics program at Alchemax and is tasked with creating new corporation-controlled super-powered soldiers called Corporate Raiders, which is honestly pretty accurate. Miguel is inspired by records of Spider-Man and hopes to one day create a similarly powered individual. After a human test subject dies in trial though, Miguel wants to resign. But his boss Tyler drugs him with the highly addictive drug Rapture, which 
genetically bonds with the user. The only way to keep getting this drug is by staying at Alchemax. But Miguel has his genes stored away. So when he sneaks in to try to reset his genetics to before he had the rapture, he accidentally combines himself with the DNA of a spider and gets powers. This is not a reason to do drugs people, just suffer from bites trying to get powers like we all did. Me several times. Number 5 Batman Beyond This is on the list because of the animation, now don't click off yet, let me explain. The pilot of the series begins in 2019, this year. In his late 50s, Bruce Wayne still fights crime in his high tech Batman suit. In the middle of the rescue, Batman suffers a mild heart attack, and at risk of being beaten to death, Bruce had to threaten to use a gun. When he realized that the gun he used was the same one as the one who killed his parents, he decides to retire, and shuts down the Batcave. His allies have either died naturally or retired, and his partners either left or had a falling out with him. All of his enemies are retired, dead, in jail or exiled, and he's severed all ties with the Justice League. His work as Batman is done. 20 years later, Terry McGinnis stays out past curfew one night to meet up with his girlfriend. They get harassed by the Jokers, a gang, and they get chased to Wayne Manor. Bruce tries to fight off the attackers, but his heart gets aggravated in the process, so Tyler has to rush him back inside. He explores the mansion and finds the Batcave, which drives Bruce to chase him out, obviously. When he gets home, his father had pulled an Uncle Ben and was killed by the Jokers, the same gang who attacked Tyler, hence why I say an Uncle Ben. After realizing what his father found and Bruce refusing to help, he steals his bat suit and goes out on his own accord. I like this story, I think it would do well in the modern day, especially because Bruce is supposed to retire this year. Number 4, Superwoman. Hailing from DC's Earth 3, this Amazonian native version of Lois Lane is one evil b She is a member of the crime syndicate and has relationships with Ultraman and Owlman. I was about to say isn't that illegal, but then I realized she's evil. She was also sleeping with Alexander Luther, the crime syndicate's greatest enemy and one of the heroes of Earth 3. She's also a freak. She has a parody of the Lasso of Truth called the Lasso of Submission. And my god, that sounds like a fun weekend. And, apparently, she posed for... Let's say suggestive. Yeah, suggestive. Photos for Earth 3 James Olsen in exchange for him doing favors. I actually knew someone like this in high school. Huh. Wait. Are we on Earth 3? And is this just one big narrative that we're all being forced to play out for the entertainment of others? Huh. Either way, she also had a son with Luther 2 while being married to Ultraman and sleeping with Owlman. What the hell? Number 3, Iron Woman. What if Iron Man was a woman? Well, Natasha Stark is just that. Imagine an Iron Man, who is a woman, okay, falls in love with Steve Rogers and ends up marrying him, causing civil war to never happen. Well, welcome to Earth 3490, where Natasha Stark is the wife of a 100 year old man and civil war never happened. Well, this universe was found by Reed Richards, who came across it while looking for realities in which the civil war ended differently. He stated that the two were deterrent to each other's more aggressive behavior, which allowed them this Earth's Reed Richards to successfully complete the superhero registration program and begin the 50 state initiative. Getting close to the end at number 2 we have White Tiger. Ava Ayala, the fifth character to assume the White Tiger mantle, she is the sister of Hector Ayala and enrolled in the Avengers Academy. She inherited the White Tiger amulet from her brother after he died at the hands of Gideon Mace. She states that the White Tiger is a family legacy and she intends to honor it. With her determination and sense of right and wrong, I think this character should have been there from the start. She is a badass and nobody tells her no. And with those nails, they can be as deadly as mine. Rare. Number 1, Iron Lantern. Hal Stark is a millionaire and the founder of Stark Aircraft. He was developing a flight simulator when it took off with him in it. He discovered it was being drawn to an alien spacecraft that he had crashed a few yards away from. Even though he had metal shards in his chest, he still went to investigate. Like, dude, you're dying. He found an alien who died before he could speak, and then now, realizing that he was dying too, he used the alien tech to make a suit of armor powered by a battery that he found in the wreck. This suit not only saved his life, but but also gave him incredible powers, allowing him to create any object out of green energy. Because of the battery being powered by, oh, the living planet. Okay. He used this suit and became the Iron Lantern and defeated the aliens that shot down the alien he had found. Because even though he didn't talk to the guy, he still wanted to avenge him. Number 10. Jack Gleason. Long time and consistent top 10 nerd commenter Rodney Lindsay made this interesting suggestion in the comments of part 1. And I thought, you know what? Maybe, actually. Now most of us are going to remember Jack Gleason as Joffrey Baratheon, or Lannister depending who you ask, in HBO's Game of Thrones series. His character was horribly unlikable, which he was supposed to be. 
with Jack himself actually being probably the nicest and most humble person I think I have ever seen. Last I heard, he has stopped acting since his time on Game of Thrones, but as a wild card fan casting, I think he would make a very good younger Barry Allen. Thanks again, Rodney, for that suggestion. I know you're watching. Number nine, John Wesley Shipp. While talking about Grant Gustin in part one, I think we were all slightly reminded that John Wesley Shipp did actually play The Flash in the 1990s Flash TV show and did an excellent job. So much so that he actually showed up reprising his character in the Grant Gustin show. Now, I'm not saying he could jump into the role where Ezra left it, but to show up as Flash at all would just be really, really nice. Since the Flash movie is dealing with Flashpoint type things, then it is entirely possible and would be a lovely bit of fan service for this fantastic Flash to show his face. Number eight, Damian Wayne as Robin. Okay, I am probably gonna get some hate for this one, but I actually like him. Hear me out. Yes, Damian Wayne starts off as a complete annoyance. He's smug, he's obnoxious, he's everything you hate about overconfident kids. But here's the thing, you're not supposed to like him. He's supposed to irritate you. He's supposed to make you mad. That way when his character develops and grows, you can actually see the journey that his character went on. And I feel that Damian Wayne has done that. Plus with Stuart Allen's excellent portrayal of him in the DC animated movie universe, I'd say the character is definitely becoming a lot more fun to see. A good actor can really bring out the best in the worst characters. While I may not like who he was at the start, I definitely feel he's more than worthy of fighting alongside Batman. So. Here's to a skilled, albeit arrogant, Robin. Number seven, Superboy, the Young Justice version. When I think of a great Superman story, it's in a situation where he isn't in complete control, when he isn't the strongest person in the room, and is still trying to understand who or what he is. When he feels alien, this is when Superman is most relatable, and no one feels more alien than the Young Justice version of Superman's son, Connor Kent, AKA Superboy. Connor Kent has many of the powers of Superman, with the exception of flight, and has never known the outside world. Unlike Superman, who was born on Krypton but raised on Earth, Connor was born on Earth but knows nothing of it. We see this version of the character gradually develop his social skills, learn to control his powers, but most importantly, we see his identity struggles with being a clone of Superman. We see him make mistakes, lash out, and yes, even some of that teen angst the comic version is famous for. But thankfully, he's significantly less irritating. And given that Connor has actually taken up the mantle of Superman while Clark is off world, I could say pretty confidently that this version of Connor is a worthy successor. Number six, Barry Allen as The Flash. Here's a fun one. Barry Allen was a big transition from the original Flash Jay Garrick, but then Wally West, who's had several appearances in noteworthy media himself, was also a big transition from Barry Allen. So Flash is going up on our list twice. So this is also number five, Wally West. Where do I begin? Barry Allen has defined the character of The Flash between the massive success of the CW series, redefining the character in his costume for generations, and featuring in the iconic event comic, Flashpoint. For many, Barry Allen is their Flash. And Wally West, he's appeared as The Flash in both Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, and appears as Kid Flash in both Young Justice and the CW Flash series. Both Barry and Wally, in every adaptation, bring something unique to the character, whether it be their skills, their fun personality, or even just their dynamic with each other. And given the sacrifices both have made for the sake of their respective Earths, I'd say that's enough for both Barry Allen and Wally West to be excellent successors to Jay Garrick. Number four, Calderon or Jackson Hyde, as Aqualad. Can you tell I'm a fan of Young Justice yet? Calderon recently took up the role of Aquaman, a role he undoubtedly is worthy of, but before that, he was Aqualad, a strong-willed, dedicated leader of the team who throughout the series demonstrates his willingness to do whatever is necessary for the sake of the mission. In the comics, Jackson Hyde has a different origin than Calder, but his appearance and role are inspired by him. Hey, kind of like Harley Quinn was taken from the cartoon. I'd say that's pretty indicative that you're doing something right. And if Aquaman is willing to hand down his title to you, I'd say you're definitely worthy of having been his sidekick. Well done, Calder. Number three, Batman Beyond, Terry McGinnis. Oh, where do I begin? First off, to be able to follow the absolute landmark series that Batman the Animated Series was is an achievement on its own, but to take that series into the distant future, where Gotham City is a pseudo-cyberpunk dystopia, and introduce a new Batman who is initially at odds with a grumpy, aging Bruce Wayne is one heck of a note to open up on. The series focuses on our new Batman, Terry McGinnis, a far younger Batman who, much like Peter Parker, struggles to balance his personal life with his life as a hero. And really, that's all you need to know to make him instantly relatable. 
Oh, and this Batman can fly with rocket boots, which I mean, that's pretty cool. Why haven't they made a new game of this Batman yet? Oh well. Either way, Bruce Wayne seems to think he can do it, and he's a hard person to impress, so that's one more replacement for my list. Number two, X-23 as Wolverine. Once again, we have a character who's actually already succeeded in taking the role from their predecessor. And really, given her near identical abilities and the success of the movie Logan, did you see it going any differently? X-23 is, as her name would suggest, the 23rd attempt to develop a female clone of Wolverine. At seven years old, she's subjected to radiation poisoning to activate her mutant genes and has adamantium bonded to her claws without any anesthetic. As if that weren't enough, she's also trained to be an assassin that responds to a trigger scent, which sends her into a murderous rage. So let's see. Top secret weapons program? Check. Wolverine's abilities? Check. Human experimentation? Check. Rage? Big check. I'd say she fits the part. Rolls all yours, X-23. Number one, Miles Morales as Spider-Man. We've been seeing a lot of this character recently, between 2018's fantastic Into the Spider-Verse and his playable appearance in the much acclaimed Spider-Man PS4 game. Miles Morales is proving not only can he take up the mantle of Spider-Man, but he can prove just as successful as Peter Parker. Originating from the story Ultimate Fallout, a series that covered the death of Peter Parker, a new Spider-Man appears, a young boy named Miles Morales. From the very moment we meet him, we can tell that Miles isn't quite a hero yet. He's new at this. He makes silly social mistakes like wearing Spider-Man's costume shortly after his death, which, yeah, not a smart move. But he tries, and that's what he has in common with Peter Parker. They don't always know what to do, but they're going to do something because the hero job is about helping people. And so, Miles Morales is unquestionably worthy of the mantle of Spider-Man. Number 10, Michaela Cole. Kicking off today's list with a choice that is kind of out of left field. If Marvel was to replace Jonathan Majors as Kang, it could be handled in a few different ways. The different variants of Kang means that finding someone to jump into the spot without much explanation is actually pretty easy to do. Well, what if Marvel decided to give us a female variant of Kang instead? It's not like it's unheard of for comic books. While Michaela Cole is totally already in the MCU playing Aneka in Black Panther Wakanda Forever, her role is way too small for the chops this actress has got. She was basically a secondary character, almost less than even that, and given her performance in that role and the skills she showed off in the limited series I May Destroy You, I think just shifting her character over to play a female king would be really cool and super interesting. She absolutely has the chops to do the job too. I think this one is a little far-fetched, but that's why it's number 10. Number 9, Damson Idris. While Michaela might be a bit of a stretch, the actor that has been talked about the most to fill the role of Kang if Jonathan gets the boot is British Nigerian actor Damson Idris. Damson is known for his roles in the crime drama Snowfall and the Netflix film Outside the Wire alongside Marvel star Anthony Mackie, both of which show enough nuance and physicality to show that Idris could take on the role without much struggle at all. An insider Jeff Snyder said on the Hot Mike podcast, Disney is looking into actors like Damson Idris as a potential replacement for Majors as Kang the Conqueror. He said, quote, And again, even though there hasn't been any movement on the Jonathan Majors front, I've heard that's the kind of actor who, like, if Jonathan Majors got the boot as Kang, someone like Damson Idris is the type of person that Marvel may look to to replace him if that, in fact, happens. Number 8. Rick Cosnett. And while we're talking about actors from the Flash TV shows, why not at least mention Rick Cosnett? In the Flash TV show, Rick here played Detective Eddie Thawne. And looking at him in the show, I was honestly sitting there going, he looks like he could play the Flash. And I think he could. I say that with no shade thrown at Grant Gustin. I just look at Rick, and then I look at a picture of comic book Barry Allen, and you can't tell me you don't see it too. Number seven, Garrett Hedlund. Hedlund's version of Barry Allen would definitely be a seasoned one. But as such would be one that stands equally with Aquaman, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman in the Justice League. He's an on-the-rise actor who's proven himself capable in both comedic and dramatic fare. He's handsome as hell and he can actually run, like normally, unlike somebody else. You can argue that he doesn't much resemble Miller, like a lot of actors on this list, but honestly, that can be easily solved by the reality warping potential of the Flashpoint timeline. Also, his natural blonde hair and six foot one frame ideally resemble the comic version much, much better. Headland's a versatile actor. He was really great in Tron, in my opinion, but has done some much better roles to prove he is a great actor since. Just don't look at that weird Peter Pan movie. I think he could kill it as Flash. Number six. Andrew Garfield. A lot of people have suggested Tom Holland as Barry Allen the Flash, or even as Wally West. And I mean, sure, I guess. But if we're talking about actors who have played Spider-Man, 
I don't think we should look over none other than Andrew Garfield. Obviously this actor has had a run as a superhero before and one that was not bad at all. Sure the movies themselves could have been a bit better, but his performance as the webhead was fantastic. We have seen Andrew as much more serious characters as well, which does make me think he could kind of find a happy medium between the two as Barry Allen. He has also got the star power to stand in an ensemble cast, so there's that. Number 5, Sam Claflin. A lot of castings I have seen for Barry have been younger guys. And while yes, that obviously makes sense, I think maybe having a slightly older, more mature version of Barry might offer something up that we haven't seen before. The other actors involved in the DCEU movies all have a bit of a rough maturity to them, at least in my opinion. And while The Flash seems to be a bit more of the comedy to the team, I don't think he should not be taken as seriously as well. His jokes have always been a bit more dad energy in my opinion anyways. The British actor Sam Claflin has been around for a while. In big franchises like The Hunger Games and Pirates of the Caribbean, but he's only 35 at the time of this video being made, giving him both big franchise experience but not at the cost of being too, too old. He's also blonde, is slim but built, has a great jawline and isn't overly serious all the time. I think he would make an interesting casting as Barry Allen. Number 4, Scott Speedman. While we're talking older actors, this guy's name is literally Speedman. While he may be a little bit too old now to play Barry Allen, Alan, in an ideal world where we could use the speed force to go back in time, younger Scott Speedman would make an excellent Barry Allen in my opinion. And if Warner Bros was feeling bold and maybe wanted to introduce Wally West, Speedman could be a mentoring Barry to whoever played Wally. He is a great actor who can no doubt pull off the serious forensic scientist side of Barry Allen. And as proven in his action roles in the Underworld movies, he can hit the super powered qualities of a hero like Flash himself. It's not likely to actually happen. but. I have always enjoyed this actor and I think he could play a very convincing Barry Allen. Number 3, Jack Quaid. I saw this somewhere and it's it's another one of those suggestions that I would never have thought of, but upon further consideration I'm like Wait a minute. The Boys star is actually consistently on the rise right now. After his fantastic breakout on that show, he has now been in the new Scream movie. If you have seen him in The Boys, you know that this guy can actually hold it down acting wise, which should be no surprise given his parents are Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan. As for playing Barry, I think he would be a kind of an oddball version of the character. But I mean, they had Ezra Miller playing the character in basically the same way and he was also completely nuts in real life too. So I feel like having someone who is actually sane in real life take on the role might be a bit better. Number 2, Logan Lerman. If Warner Brothers is considering Dylan O'Brien, then I think it's fair for them to consider Logan Lerman as well. I honestly get these two confused all the time. Now, he does have a bit of a different vibe compared to O'Brien, but he is arguably more accomplished than O'Brien with roles in Percy Jackson, Fury, Perks of Being a Wallflower alongside Mr. Miller, 310 to Yuma, and even as far back as The Patriot. If you have seen him in the Amazon Prime show Hunters alongside Al Pacino, plus all of his other movie titles, then I think you'll have to agree that he has the acting chops, star power, physicality, seriousness, and wit to step into the role of Ezra Miller's Barry Allen. But I'd love to hear other people's opinions on this one, because I'm, I'm not too sure. And number one, Lucas Till. Shout out to commenter Gilbert Millers who decided to let us all know literally 50 times in the comments of part one that quote unquote the actor hashtag Lucas Till he's literally the perfect casting for the role of hashtag Barry Allen slash hashtag the flash in hashtag DCEU hashtag recast the flash. Okay yes let's talk about Lucas Till. In all seriousness I actually do really agree with you. I think he would make an excellent flash. I literally see no reason not to cast him. He looks like the comics Barry Allen. He is young enough, he has been a superhero before, people know who he is, and most importantly, I don't believe he's a criminal. Kicking off the list at number 10, Spider-Man replaced by Maddie. In The Amazing Spider-Man issue 5, we see on the front cover a photo of Spider-Man, with the caption, the other Spider-Man below it. So just who may this be? Meet Martha Maddie Franklin. She was a teenager living in New York. Father was Jerry Franklin, a wealthy businessman, and her uncle was J. Jonah Jameson. Gotta love those holiday dinners, probably so much yelling. In Amazing Spider-Man issue 441, we see something called the Gathering of the Five. So after Martha overheard 
heard her father and Norman Osborn talking about this ceremony, she took her father's place instead. So this ceremony was a ritual with five arcane relics, where it goes one of two ways. Either you get powers from this ritual, or you pay the ultimate price. One in five odds to gain knowledge, power, immortality, or insanity, or death. Sick. We love a good gamble. That's always fun. Osborn gets power, and Maddie gets superhuman abilities and flight. So when Spider-Man disappeared for a few months, Maddie stepped in to take over. Her run only lasted 18 issues, no thanks to Kingpin, but after she's rescued by the other Spider-Woman and Jessica Jones, she retired. And before we go on to number nine, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be so helpful and helps our channel out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's go back to some more superheroes who were replaced. Number nine, Batman replaced by Azrael. After the Nightfall storyline when Batman, you know, got wrecked by Bane, he decided to pass on the Batman mantle to not Dick Grayson, no, no. Instead, he chose Jean-Paul Valley, AKA Azriel. His run on Batman wasn't the same as Bruce's at all. I mean, for starters, Azriel's methods were violent and irresponsible. So already I feel like this is going downhill just looking at a resume. Some of these replacements are good, some of them are bad. That's how we do. That's pretty much the opposite of what we're going for here. He was, however, capable of defeating Bane with his new suit, so that's cool, it's fine, I guess. We'll give him that. Fine, fair, good job. But this guy thought that made him an all-round better Batman and a permanent successor. Wrongo. So once Bruce recovered, he had to force Azrael to leave the position. So then a shame John Paul Valley returned to his Azrael days. Imagine getting caught for a petty crime on one of the nights that Azrael was patrolling. You think you're getting caught by Batman, maybe a slap on the wrist, all of a sudden this dude's just like whipping you off buildings, and he looks like that? Dude, you're a villain. I'm sorry, my friend, you are a villain. In our number eight spot, we have Natasha Stark. Here we have an alternate version of Iron Man hailing from Earth 3490, and it's a unique one. This Iron Man is actually Iron Woman, born Natasha Stark rather than Tony. She's exactly like Tony in the sense of having the same abilities as the 616 Stark and an almost identical suit of armor, except it's referred to as her Iron Woman armor, of course. Here's where things get really interesting though. Because this alternate version of Stark is a woman, Civil War never happened. Instead, Natasha gets involved with Captain America Steve Rogers, the two marry, and the Civil War event never occurs on Earth 3490. Apparently, they were a deterrent to each other's more aggressive behavior. Natasha first appeared in Dark Reign Fantastic Four issue 2 in 2009 when Reed Richards was in search of alternate realities in which Civil War had ended differently. Moving on to our number 7 spot, we have Ant-Man Wolverine. Yes, this exists. Secret Wars gave us a slew of alternates of various characters, and this includes a version of Ant-Man who was Wolverine. Or rather, a version of Wolverine who operates under the Ant-Man mantle. First appearing in Secret Wars Battle World Issue 3, this little Logan has the same powers as those who have operated under the Ant-Man mantle. And tiny claws to boot! How fun. This Ant-Man Wolverine was one of many alternate versions of Wolverine who were brought together in an attempt to fight a pacifist version of Wolverine, aka Monk by Mojo. Now these other Wolverines involve another alias of Hank Pym's, Giant Man, who as you guessed it was a Wolverine who could also grow in size. There is also a Cat Wolverine and a Dog Wolverine, but kind of less credible than the rest of the other alternate Wolverines, just saying. And at number 6, Janet Van Dyne of Earth 1610. This version of the Wasp is from the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610. While her fate is a pretty brutal one, and her relationship with Hank Pym is you know, textbook domestic abuse, she possesses something that Van Dyne of 616 does not, the ability to actually transform into a wasp-human hybrid. Born a mutant, her mutation gave her insect-like traits that also expanded to her behavior. She could lay eggs and eat insects, which yes, is kind of gross, but the benefits at least outweigh the downsides. When she would reduce in size via the force of her willpower, she would grow a pair of insect-like wings from her back. She retained her normal strength when reducing in size and could control the exact proportions of that size, although her body contained a natural neurological reflex that prevented her from shrinking below a specific size. So can't get too small. And she also has an ability called bioelectrical blasts, in which she produces energy that she calls her wasp sings. She could use these blasts when at full size, which was essentially the equivalent of being struck by a lightning bolt. Moving on to number 5, Iron Maniac from Earth 5012. Okay, sure, we are looking at an Iron Man here who is technically a little off his rocker. Anthony Stark of Earth 5012, who calls himself Iron Maniac due to him believing that he is, I quote, the sole survivor of a sane world living in a backwards insane world, is from an alternate timeline where most Avengers members had been slain by the alien Titanus. 
<laughs> During this period, Reed Richards became power hungry and turned his back on the remaining heroes, and Stark ended up being scarred by an attack from the Human Torch. Essentially, he turns into a Victor Von Doom esque character, setting up his base in Latveria in order to take over the world and save it from Richards. Compared to the original Tony, his body contains additional cybernetic enhancements, and he has developed a technology called power dampeners, which, in his timeline, he uses to counteract the Fantastic Four's powers. Nifty. Moving on to number four, Weapon Hex. Weapon Hex is the product of the Infinity War storyline in which multiple characters were merged together. More on that later. Weapon Hex is an amalgamation of Scarlet Witch and X-23, aka Laura Kinney, Wolverine's cloned daughter of sorts. Her origin story is an amalgamation of both characters' origins, with the result being a character who has the reality warping abilities of Wanda Maximoff and the adamantium skeleton and claws of Laura Kinney. Essentially, she is Scarlet Witch with a defensive and melee upgrade, mixed with a dose of X-23's inherent trauma from being the literal creation of an experiment. Regardless though, she's pretty kickass. In at number 3, Storm Thor, from Earth 904. <laughs> That rhymes. This alternate version of Thor is one in which Storm becomes the goddess of thunder. This occurred in an issue of Marvel's hypothetical series, What If, in Volume 2, Issue 12 from 1990, within a story titled, What If the X-Men Had Stayed in Asgard. The story follows an instance in which the X-Men and New Mutants found themselves in Asgard, if the title didn't give that away already, with some of the mutants returning to Earth and others staying put. This led to a new age of X-Men on our home planet and a bunch of different X-Men members, the likes of Rogue, Nightcrawler, Mirage, Sunspot, and Cypher adopting an Asgardian way of life. Storm ended up becoming the new god of thunder due to Thor being trapped in the form of a Midgard frog. When Hela and Carnilla conspired to steal Storm's soul, Storm bested them, and Thor was released because of it. Thor renounced the throne, opting to go live on Earth instead, and gave it to Storm, who became the queen of Asgard, since Odin had died. She also had her own hammer to wield called the Stormbringer. And hey, having a kick-ass version of Storm replace Thor on the Avengers? I mean, count us in. That's pretty cool. Moving on to number two, Maestro Hulk. Hailing from the dystopian future of Earth 9200, Maestro Hulk is an alternate version of the Hulk who was a horrible tyrant. He first appeared in the 1992 story The Incredible Hulk Future Perfect Issue 1. Now, despite him being literally insane and a complete obsessive sadist, he is a version of the Hulk who is a more experienced and stronger version than the regular 616 Hulk. The 6161 was ultimately able to best Maestro, and thus implying that Maestro's demise was actually the catalyst event that created the Hulk in the first place. There's a whole time displacement thing that happened. That being said, let's play a game of hypotheticals here, as if we weren't already in this list. If Maestro was actually a good guy instead, he would be a massive asset to the Avengers team. He's got all the benefits of being the Hulk, the super strength, speed, stamina, durability, the retentive healing factor, capable of absorbing and resisting radiation, resistance to mind control, all that fun stuff, while maintaining his genius level intellect in this form. And he's immortal. He's like an upgraded, although still kind of mad version of the Hulk, and hey, that's pretty cool. And last but not least in our number one spot, Soldier Supreme. Soldier Supreme is one of the more recently created alternates on our list. He is an amalgamation of Captain America and Doctor Strange, a product of that Infinity War storyline. Now that storyline involves Gamora using the Infinity Gems to fold reality in half and create something called Warp World. This merged many characters into one, with Steve Rogers and Stephen Strange becoming Stephen Rogers. Nah. Their origin stories were merged, their powers were merged, and so were their aesthetics. This results in a version of Captain America who can do all of the things that Doctor Strange can do. In other words, Cap got a serious upgrade. Imagine having a Captain America who is basically a Sorcerer Supreme, or I guess Soldier Supreme, on the Avengers. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Starting us off in at number 10, Super Soldier. We're starting off our list with a number that would be an awesome addition to the Avengers roster, but would feasibly never manage to even be considered for the team in the regular 616 universe. That's because he's an amalgamation of Steve Rogers and Superman. This is Super Soldier, a product of the combined DC Marvel amalgam universe in which various characters from each publisher were merged together to create new individuals. It's a neat concept, and it gave us a lot of interesting characters. Naturally, it makes sense that Captain America and Superman would make a great match for each other, with the hero gaining his abilities thanks to the Super Soldier formula, which was created thanks to cellular samples from an alien corpse. Little less of an inspiring superhero origin story, isn't it? He can do everything that Cap and Supes can do, so needless to say, that's impressive. But damned if DC would ever let him join a 616 Avengers team. 
Up next, number nine, Hawkeye 2099. A 2099 version of Hawkeye appeared in Secret Wars, and he's really dope. So 2099 is a Marvel Comics imprint that initially began being published in 1992 as one possible future in the Marvel Universe. It's meant to take place 100 years in the future, and was initially titled Marvel 2093, which clearly was a little less catchy. Anyway, this Hawkeye shows up in Secret Wars 2019 issue 1 from 2015 as part of Alchemex's Avengers team. Named Max, last name never revealed, he differs from the traditional iterations of Hawkeye by having his DNA mixed with a hawk's, which gave him real claws and real wings. Number 8, the Android Torch replaced by Johnny Storm. Flame on, rock on, right on. So before Johnny Storm made his comic book debut in 1961's Fantastic Four issue 1, the previous title of the Human Torch was actually not even a human at all. The character goes back even further to when Marvel was actually referred to as Timely Comics. That's how old we're going. So he was originally an android who became known as Jim Hammond later on. So this android torch came from the mind of Professor Phineas T. Horton. Well, Tim Horton's there. This android he created matched a human being. It moved like a human being and it thought like a human being and it also spontaneously combusted into flames like a human being. We all do that, right? No? Okay. In Avengers West Coast issue 50, the team revived this version of the torch when they found it in a grave during the investigation of Vision's origin. What a find. Number seven, the Hulk replaced by Amadeus Cho. Amadeus Cho made his debut in Amazing Fantasy Volume 2, number 15. He is a Korean American raised in Arizona, and when Amadeus Cho participated in a quiz show named Brain Fight at just the age of 15, he won that quiz show and was awarded 5,000 smackaroos while being deemed the seventh smartest man in the world by Reed Richards himself. Not a bad day at all, not a bad day. Pythagoras sent out a squad of goons to take out Amadeus, and he barely escaped. He ran away, and then that when he met the Hulk. So years later, Amadeus would eventually become the Hulk. Well, rather, the totally awesome Hulk, that is. He got stuck with dangerous amounts of radiation that should have made him go mad, but instead he got special nanites to absorb the Hulk's powers. He took pride in trying to be a better, smarter Hulk. At one point, he exiled himself into space on a satellite to study himself and his ability to control himself. To be safe, to be away from everybody else. I mean, to have the power of the Incredible Hulk minus the anger, to be in complete control, Sounds like the Hulk we all deserve, most of the time. Number six, Hank Pym replaced by Scott Lang. Since Ant-Man made his big screen debut back in 2015, it's hard to imagine anybody else in that role other than Paul Rudd. Even other cast members can't take their eyes off this gorgeous man. Introduced in the same movie, we also have Hank Pym, played by the fabulous Michael Douglas. But in the comics, Hank Pym was far from fabulous especially in a 1963 Avengers issue that shocked readers. So the issue had Hank Pym assault Janet, AKA the Wasp, AKA his lover. Physical and mental abuse, yeah, this guy's gotta go. See ya. Even in the movies as well, there's no way Disney would ever have had Hank Pym be the one that turns evil and turns into Yellow Jacket like he did in the comics. They instead made Darren Cross the Yellow Jacket and avoided that whole horrible comic storyline altogether. See, readers were delighted when Scott Lang entered the Marvel comics in Marvel premiere issue 47. This is the Ant-Man that fans liked much more, especially the screenwriter for 2015's Ant-Man when he was still attached to the project. Edgar Wright chose Scott Lang's run because he grew up reading it and he liked his version more for obvious reasons. Number five, Tim Drake replaced by Stephanie Brown. Tim Drake made his comic book debut in Batman issue 463. He became the third Robin at a young age after Jason Todd was replaced, which I'll get into a little later. But eventually he was forced to retire. But meanwhile, Stephanie broke it off with Tim Drake because she thought that he'd been sneaking around behind her back, cheating on her and stuff. So she needed something else to focus on, so she made a homemade suit and then snuck into the Batcave and demanded that Batman would make her the new Robin after he retired. So Batman's like, Okay, you got it. That easy, let's do it, let's party. So cut to several months of training, a new costume upgrade that looked the exact same as Tim's suit. She's now rolling with Batman. And the two actually did pretty well together. I mean, for a little while, because you know, that's how these things go with Robin. She then disobeyed orders on a couple of missions and was promptly fired. No more suit, you're out of here, bye. Now this is where things go from bad to worse. See, because of this, Stephanie felt like she had to prove herself to Batman, because everybody's gotta prove themselves to Batman and do crazy shit all the time. So she took one of his plans for the Gotham underworld and tried to step up herself, but this unfortunately led to the events of Batman War Games, where Stephanie was captured by Black Mask, tortured, and then she sadly passed away in a hospital with a regretful failed Bruce Wayne by her side. Sometimes a handy replacement can turn into tragedy. That's just how it goes, at least with this guy. 
Number four, Spider Man replaced by Otto Octavius. While some replacements for the webhead are great, there are a handful of times when the new Spider Man was a terrible leader. So now we go to the Amazing Spider Man issue 700, where we find a dying Dr. Otto Octavius. He's not looking too hot, so he uses his big brain, and this guy switches bodies with Spider Man. So now Spider Man would be slowly passing away in his body, and he would live on the inside of a superhero and try and do some good. He thought he could be a better, superior Spider Man. Now, the best part of this is that Peter was still inside of his own self, a little bit. He was able to remain inside the body and could communicate with the new webhead Otto Octavius. Your conscious is literally Spider-Man. How neat slash terrifying would that be? It's cool to see this version of Spider-Man and after a few minutes with the new younger, healthier body, he dons himself the new name, the Superior Spider-Man. He ends up getting himself in trouble because of his violent superhero methods. This is like the ultimate Freaky Friday sequel gone wrong. This is just a mess. Number three, Thor replaced by Jane Foster. I'm super excited that Taika Waititi is returning for Thor Love and Thunder. Thor Ragnarok was one of the best movies I've seen, especially with Marvel, it was so fun. So when they announced that Natalie Portman was returning to the sequel and she will wield the hammer, we're finally excited that we get to meet Jane Foster's Thor. In 2014, Jane took over the hammer in Thor God of Thunder, issue 25. The tough part about her version of Thor is that the more that she uses the hammer and possesses the powers of Thor, the worse her cancer gets. Now, I really hope this part doesn't make it into the movie because I'll just be sad. I'll come out of there depressed. So during the comic Original Sin, Nick Fury obtains the Watcher's Eye, which is a real nice tool, and he whispers in Thor's ear, Gore was right. So now, Gore thinks that gods cause more trouble than anything and they're the worst. It makes Thor drop his hammer. So while Thor uses yarn board instead, Mjolnir needs a new helping hand. So enter Jane Foster. So now while the cancer setback is absolutely awful, Jane doesn't let it interfere with her duty. At one point, her and Freya go against Odin, Cole Borsten, Frost Giants, Loki, Dark Elves. Like she goes hard in the comics after she takes over and I'm really pumped to see that side of Natalie Portman on the big screen. Number two, Captain America replaced by John Walker. With Steve Rogers being an old man last time we saw him in the MCU, odds are he's either retired or he's since passed away. Either way, the team needs a replacement, and so does the government, apparently. So John Walker has now entered the chat. Wyatt Russell is playing this character named US Agent, and in the comics, John Walker first came in with Captain America issue 323. He actually started off opposed to Captain America. He would stage fights, make himself look like a better leader, and then he took on the alias Super Patriot, which is you know, so American. And then in Captain America issue 333, we see him take on the role of Captain America. It's crazy, it's like they're casting a movie. There's headshots laid out, the government's looking at their options, and now they're like, hey, you know what? We're just gonna get this guy who launched the super villain off of a building, and then he'll be our new Star Spangled Super Patriot guy. Let's do it. So we're currently in the middle of Falcon and the Winter Soldier on Disney+, Plus. so hopefully the shield goes back to who it really belongs to, Sam Wilson. And finally, number one, Jason Todd replaced by Tim Drake. A Death in the Family, written by Jim Starlin back in 1988, we got to see the death of the second Robin, Jason Todd, who I mentioned earlier. So for starters, this was a choice that readers had to make back in the day. So you could call a number and vote for the comics if they should kill off this version of Robin. That's crazy. You're like, beep, 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 beep. Kill him. So Batman had asked Barbara Gordon to come out of retirement to keep an eye on him during a couple of missions. But she saw this side of him, this dark, brutal, angry side, and she warned Batman, rightfully so. So Jason was tracking this lead to find his real birth mother who was actually being blackmailed by the Joker the whole time. And the Joker got his hands on Jason Todd and he beat him to a pulp. It's brutal. And then after the Joker is done beating him, he leaves Jason, of course, setting off a bomb afterwards, just for good measure, just to make sure. So Batman arrived a little too late after the bomb had gone off and he held the Boy Wonder's body in his hands. So sad. So afterwards, he comes back as Red Hood to find that he's been replaced after his death by Tim Drake. He calls himself Red Robin to avoid tainting the Robin name, but Red Robin, Blood Robin, I don't know, it sounds worse, but it's an animal. I get it, I get it. Red Robin sounds bad though. Batman considers this one of his greatest failures, not properly training Jason Todd as Robin, and we all agree. Ever since Marvel started independently producing its movies with 2008's Iron Man, they were practically unstoppable for a little over a decade. As we all know, that reached its peak with the $2.8 billion success of 2019's Avengers Endgame. By that point, Marvel had earned nearly $30 billion over 32 
two films. Since then, things have been on a very upsetting decline. Marvel's current troubles can really be traced back to 2020 when the COVID pandemic resulted in a panic to help boost Disney's stock price back up. And the way they tried to do that was with an endless stream of interconnected Marvel content for Disney+. The plan was basically that there would never be a halt in superhero content, with either a film being released in theaters or a new television series streaming at any given moment. But it turns out that it is entirely possible to oversaturate the superhero market, burn people out on spandex wearing do-gooders, and it is entirely possible for the once guaranteed money-making Marvel machine to be put under too much stress and begin to crack. Not to mention the interwoven storyline playing out over a bunch of shows and movies while also being on multiple platforms, understandably is creating quite a bit of confusion for more casual viewers who sometimes just want to enjoy a movie that stands on its own two feet. So, in September of this year, Marvel creatives, including Kevin Feige, gathered together in Palm Springs for the studio's annual retreat. And while they had many things to discuss, including poor script development, failing box office results, including failures they are likely to experience in the future with the release of the Marvels, as well as the abysmal state of some of the studio's CGI in recent years, you saw the title of this video. One of the biggest and most pressing topics of discussion was Jonathan Majors. Majors had been poised to carry the next phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe as its next big bad, following Josh Brolin's Thanos, with Majors playing the time-traveling villain Kang the Conqueror. While not every Marvel project since Endgame has featured Kang, Marvel's timeline pointed towards Avengers the Kang Dynasty, with the Disney Plus show Loki being the first project to feature Majors Kang, and Quantumania building upon that even further, with Majors pretty much stealing every scene that he appeared in as Kang the Conqueror. But now, instead of being set to carry this next phase of Marvel back to success, Majors is headed to a high-profile trial in New York later this month. The Quantumanium actor was arrested back in March, accused of getting physical with a woman that he was with at the time. In April, other alleged victims of Majors began speaking with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, and then, ahead of a hearing in October, media outlets obtained a court filing referencing an incident in London involving Majors that led his ex-girlfriend to seek medical attention. The girlfriend we are talking about also happened to work on Quantumania as a movement coach, and this all took place while season two of Loki was being filmed with Majors. On October 25th, a New York judge denied Majors' motion to dismiss the case, which ensures that the actor will stand trial in November this month. His legal team is attempting to keep some material in the case sealed, so we don't know everything. Majors does stand by the fact that he is innocent though, and even the victim. And given what we have seen and know so far, it's really hard to say which way it's going to go. On the Disney executive side of things though, they initially were confident that they could get by playing a waiting game to see what happens, given that Avengers The Kang Dynasty wasn't expected to begin shooting until early 2024. But things aren't looking good. With everything I just explained, Majors was also dropped by his publicists and managers. He still remains a client at the agency where he landed after CAA parted with him, but apparently CAA parted with him for his quote, brutal conduct towards their staff, according to sources. And that was before any of the arrests took place. Which brings us to what is Marvel going to do? A studio source has said that regardless of the actor's legal issues, Marvel already considered moving away from majors leading this next MCU phase because of the box office performance of Quantumania, which was not good. But you see, majors was really freaking good in Quantumania, and honestly, in every project he's appeared in, including this new season of Loki. He's a big presence in the MCU, and that presence has only been reinforced, especially with the finale of Loki Season 2, which will be out on November 9th, apparently setting up majors for the next Avengers movie. On top of that, the studio was denied any chance to rewrite anything because, as most people know, all the writers went on a massive strike. The damage to Majors' reputation and the chance he could lose the case has forced Marvel to reconsider its plans and, according to sources, executives discussed backup plans including pivoting to another comic book adversary. One of the biggest keys to saving Marvel from this whole thing may just be Disney's 2019 purchase of 21st Century Fox. That deal brought the X-Men and the Fantastic Four back under the studio's control. Fans are getting super hyped about next year's Deadpool 3, which unites Ryan Reynolds' Merc with a 
mouth with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, which I have almost no doubts will be an awesome success. But this purchase also brought with it a planned reboot of Fantastic Four, slated for 2025. Not to mention the purchase gives Feige an opportunity to reimagine the X-Men franchise in the MCU's world. Now that the WGA strike is in the past, Marvel has started talking to writers about bringing the X-Men into the MCU fold. But who cares? I want to focus on the Fantastic Four for one simple reason. Marvel executives may actually be considering moving away from Kang the Conqueror as their big bad and may instead be looking toward none other than Doctor Doom to lead the charge of villainy and honestly, depending on who they cast, of course, I'm so here for it. Considering Doctor Doom's involvement in all the comic book adaptations of Secret Wars, which is the title of the big, big Avengers movie that this phase is leading to, I can 100% see the MCU using Kang to lead into Doom, and there are lots of ways they can do it. Doctor Doom and Kang in the comics are actually not too far removed from one another. It was first introduced in Fantastic Four Annual number one, that Kang believed he was actually descended from Doctor Doom himself. The two met in space after both being defeated by the Fantastic Four, and Kang explains how he stole his time machine from his ancestor, Doctor Doom. No one ever seemed too interested in picking up on that idea though, so it was mostly one of those, hey, uh, it could be true kind of things that got kind of forgotten about. In Marvel Superhero Secret Wars number one, Doom turns down an offer from the supervillains to be their leader, and Kang is basically like, yeah, I might be his descendant, but I don't care, and he tries to attack him with a big old laser, which resulted in Secret Wars number four, when Doom ordered the robot Ultron to destroy Kang. And then in Fantastic Four number 273, John Byrne revealed that Reed Richards' dad, Nathaniel, had built a time machine before Doctor Doom ever did. So now, Kang was actually a descendant of Nathaniel Richards, and that's who his ancestor who built a time machine was. So yes, I could see this actually working with everything the MCU has recently built up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Marvel will be saved. As viewers are getting more and more disappointed with the MCU, Feige has been pulling the plug on projects that aren't working. With the most upsetting disappointment being the Blade reboot with Oscar-winning actor Mahershala Ali. The project has gone through at least five writers, two directors, and one shutdown six weeks before production. One person familiar with the script even said that the story at one point morphed into a woman-led narrative filled with life lessons, which had the titular character of Blade relegated to the fourth lead, which completely blew my mind when I heard that. There were reports that Ali was ready to exit the project over script issues, so Feige went back and hired Michael Green, the writer of the awesome Logan movie, to start fresh. Speculation around town is that the studio is looking to make the film, now slated for 2025, but on a budget of less than $100 million, which is a big stretch. Sources say there have even been talks to bring back the original gang for an Avengers movie. I'm talking about bringing back Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man and Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow, both of whom were taken out in Avengers Endgame, and it would also mean giving Chris Evans' Captain America some wrinkle cream. But the studio hasn't yet committed to the idea, and if it were able to bring those actors back, it would not be cheap by a long shot. Mm -hmm.